hi everyone. Um, thank you for joining us and welcome to today's Scottish Drugs Forum webinar, All Burnt Out. My name is Samantha Stewart and I'm a Senior Development Officer at SDF um, on our Inclusion and Peer Engagement team um, and I'm delighted to be chairing the session on this sunny afternoon. Hopefully it's sunny where you are. Um, in today's webinar we will be talking about burnout and experiences and perspectives of this from frontline staff um, across the sector and considering how we can support these staff in their responses to Scotland's public health emergencies at the moment, these obviously being the drug death crisis and COVID-19, which continues to um, have huge impacts um, on all aspects of the field. So in the first section today, we have four speakers who will be presenting for us. Uh, we have Katie McLeod from SDF, Hannah Carver from the University of Stirling, Gwen Harrison on behalf of the Highland Third Sector Interface and Adrian Hanna from SDF. Um, we will then be joined by a panelist, by some panelists um, from across the sector and the country, who I'll introduce um, when we get to that point for a discussion and a Q&A session. So we're now going to move on to our first speaker today, who is Katie McLeod, my colleague at SDF, and she's our peer research engagement manager at SDF. So over to you, Katie. Thanks very much, Sam. That. Uh, okay, so today, thanks very much for having us. Um, I'm going to be speaking about burnout and frontline services for people who use uh, drugs. And I've just put a wee mention of the hashtag there if you are engaging in Twitter. Okay, so the different things that I'm going to be covering today. So I'm going to be talking about initial findings from a mixed method evaluation that we've conducted in, in Dundee um, of uh, people's levels of burnout amongst strong drugs and alcohol services in Dundee and um, so just a snapshot evaluation um, and we're going to also be speaking about wider experiences from SDF's peer research and evaluation work um, experiences from SDF's drug death prevention work and finally also some experiences from SDF's training and workforce development work. So first of all, just to touch on the, the work completed in Dundee. Um, so thanks very much to um, Dundee ADP and the Project Steering Group um, based in Dundee and also Cora Foundation who funded um, the evaluation as well. So just a, a very quick overview of what this snapshot uh, sample was. So 40 staff conducted um, an online staff survey which utilised two valid validated tools for looking at burnout, the Maslach burnout inventory and the areas of work life survey which I'll talk about in a wee bit more detail. We also did in-depth interviews or focus groups with 23 people, so 16 frontline staff and seven managers or service leads um, just to give us some qualitative data as well. Um, the staff sample was a mixture of NHS, charity, third sector organisations, local authority and grassroots community led organisations as well. So just a couple of uh, quotes to kind of kick us off. So um, as we can see there, this, this participants talking about, um, you know, it's a real issue in the sector at the moment. Um, and they were talking about the, the pressures, particularly with COVID and that burnout is something that, they, that we need as a sector to pay much more attention to. Um, and we probably have neglected it over the last uh, number of years as well. And it can really have a wide range of factors that will impact on the individual. So certainly within the sample, people talked about a range of both emotional and uh, sort of physical health impacts. Um, and certainly in terms of mo emotional exhaustion that came out very high, but also physical health impacts within the sample too. So the next person is talking about training and induction um, and really how burnout needs to be embedded in all our training, but right at induction stage. So as a workforce, uh, we need to get much more honest about burnout um, and in that very early training. So not only like what does it feel like for people, what does it look like? How should staff uh, recognise it in themselves and also how should managers um, be able to recognise it in the staff that they support? Okay, and in terms of causes of burnout, um, causes were really multifaceted. So certainly amongst this sample, um, and probably unsurprisingly, um, the high rates of drug-related deaths and near-fatal overdoses came out as a major impact, both in the quantitative and the qualitative data. 
um, where staff had experienced a limited follow-up or there was a lack of resources um, or specialist support for staff that had been affected, that could be a causal factor as well. Staff cited high caseload sizes and workload um, as a major aspect of burnout. Um, and when I say high caseload sizes, um, we're often talking astronomical levels and that balance also with maybe having to do other tasks such as duty, for example, cover for other staff that, that might be off as well. They might also be doing elements of outreach or group work on top of their, their caseload. But certainly a lot of staff talked about levels of people around um, up to 80 sometimes um, that they had to regularly check in with. So re really high volumes of caseloads. Staff shortages and the additional capacity issues were, were right, right through a lot of the responses as well. So it could be everything from absence of staff, and um, there was issues around staff retention, uh, pressures of supporting new or less experienced staff as well, where you've got a lot of new staff coming in. So there was this kind of cyclical effect that occurred as well. Um, and again, unsurprisingly, the emotional impact of supporting clients. So, you know, the stuff that is going to result um, from that empathic engagement when you're working with people. And um, so working with clients who are stigmatized, marginalized and have often complex and adverse life histories as well. Stigma again came right through all parts of the sample. Um, so both direct experiences um, people often cited media coverage, but also criticism from other services as well, you know, so that maybe affected poor partnership working, but also at organisational and, and governmental levels as well. So, you know, again, the sort of focus on services um, also could, could be um, a, an aspect that was difficult for people. Personal factors such as individual care and responsibilities, so things like childcare and things like that, these were all uh, key factors. So just a, a couple of quotes to sort of highlight some of these themes as well as this person saying it, it's really hard to remain engaged and not be in all these aspects if you're working with such levels of trauma day after day, year after year. Um, and that, that impact of working with trauma, loss, risk, overdose, um, you know, all the things that, that go with um, substance use as well. So all these sort of aspects. And again, around the caseload size, um, and, and some of the staffing pressures as well. It left staff feeling like they were constantly firefighting as this person's describing. The minute you put one fire out, there's another one and another one. And again, that cyclical effect. So just a few aspects in terms of challenges for the sector. Um, as we see, um, this, this again is the quantity of data. So the exposure to drug related deaths um, and near fatal overdoses was um, absolutely the, the sort of major um, aspect that people cited, but high caseloads again came out, um, you know, as a common feature. Other things that, that were also prominent were things like lack of specialist services to signpost people to that in terms of clients. So things like specialist mental health services or general health services, that was maybe difficult pathways, things like that. And then I guess a lack of specialised training as well for staff that were maybe having to hold and more complex clients and maybe feeling working out outside their skill level a little bit as well. Um, as this person describes the emphasis that we have on trauma-informed practice, we need to think about that in the contact, context of the whole workforce as well and think about, like I say, that um, result of empathic engagement that will also impact on workers as well and you know that that last point really is quite stark for me you know are we inhuman are we supposed to get on with it so we really need to be considering this in our work and this other person again chiming with some of these themes and um, you know thinking about the human aspect of staff um, as well as clients is important and so looking at, at burnout in terms of other factors, so things around emotional exhaustion, what were some of the other causes as well? Staff definitely saw that need to improve this. Um, we kind of touched on uh, training um, a little bit as well. So it was not only about prevention, but recognition um, across uh, staff and managers. Lived experience was something that was mentioned, and I should say that the lived experience within the sample, both in, in the qualitative and quantitative um, was certainly around, around about half um, of people cited 
personal direct lived experience, whether that was mental health or substance use. And for those people that didn't have um, direct lived experience, a lot of people did talk about family experience as well. And when people were talking about their experiences of this, they thought about lived experience could be both an asset or a potential vulnerability um, to things like emotional exhaustion. Management style and organisational culture were key factors in whether they could contribute or prevent burnout. And we'll talk about some of the preventative aspects a little bit later on. The impact of COVID-19 was varied across the sample. It presented opportunities, but also um, I would say overall, it was generally highlighted as an additional source of burnout for staff. As this person talks about within their own lived experience where you've got direct lived experience of trauma and um, this can sometimes make you more susceptible and um, but equally it's really key to mention that lived experience was absolutely a driver um, for being involved in this type of work as well so I guess what people were describing was the balance that can happen so it can absolutely be an asset and be a driving factor uh, for engaging in the work but also there can be aspects of vulnerability. This person's talking about the impact of COVID. And um, so talking about that inability to be able to um, remove yourself from your work if your work um, is then in your home as well. So they talk about challenges with finishing times and um, not being able to take a lunch break, feeling like you're on call all the time that you need to be there. And that, that was certainly something that came out um, highly across people that did describe it in more negative ways as well. And they sum it up with saying it's, it's not really a good place to be. Okay, so just moving on, I'm going to look at the areas of work-life survey. Um, so, um, important to say that um, with regards to the areas of work-life survey as well, this gives, it doesn't give um, an overall um, indication of burnout, it just gives um, indication into the workplace factors that could potentially lead to burnout. Um, what's important to say really about the data as well is that NHS staff had consistently, consistently low scores across the different domains. So across workload, feeling a sense of control, feeling a sense of rewards, the community aspect, um, uh, being able to be treated fairly and uh, uh, feeling feelings of value as well. Third sector comparatively had consistently higher um, scores and um, so there was immediately a, a kind of stark um, difference between the sectors and really um, in terms of the sample size um, we were only really able to do statistical significance testing between these um, two groups um, to give uh, these kind of results because the other sample sizes for sectors were, were lower. Okay and in terms of the the Maslach burnout inventory um, Again, it came out quite highly that NHS staff had higher rates um, of emotional exhaustion um, and depersonalization scores as well. So a cynicism towards, for example, our work, clients, um, other staff members. So indicating that they had more frequent experiences of burnout. So certainly in terms of the staff, what they talked about is a um, number of, uh, you know, kind of times a year or month or per week. Um, the third sector had much lower overall scores for exhaustion and depersonalization, so they experienced burnout um, less frequently as well. Um, the differences between the sectors were significantly different um, in these two subscales. Um, the most striking di di difference was for the measure of emotional exhaustion. So in terms of depersonalization, um, staff spoke about um, two aspects towards this. So staff could identify cynical attitudes towards service users or the work. And um, they also spoke about loss of connection or sometimes cynical attitudes towards colleagues and other staff wider in the sector as well. Desensitization and emotional detachment um, was kind of linked to high volumes and the regular, regularity of drug related deaths and near fatal overdoses. And we could, um, you know, make a guess that this might suggest some reduction in empathy or certainly suggest that there could be um, potentially things um, that might be described as compassion fatigue or more recently um, a movement to call this empathetic distress fatigue. 
Relationships and links with other services could be a causal or a protective factor for depersonalization. So again, where there was poor working relationships that tended to uh, result in much more cynical attitudes towards the services. Um, one aspect of maybe kind of cynical um, aspects towards the work. So th th this is one example um, where people sort of talked about the workload that um, was generated um, from things like near fatal overdoses or drug related deaths as well. So again, talking about it in those kind of terms maybe suggests an aspect of depersonalization. Um, people also talk about um, the frustrations that they could experience towards clients. Um, so again, kind of maybe having expectations and, and maybe an element of a, a sense of slightly less compassionate responses um, to you know, more challenging behaviours as well uh, was, was evident in some of the qualitative responses as well. Um, so a lot of people talked about this last point of people not taking responsibility as well. Um, staff talked about feeling really devalued where there was sort of poor working relationships as well with other services. So this person's describing how they feel that their clients um, a group, they, they can be touched with a barge pole um, and they're being brutally honest about it, but the pandemic has, has really sort of highlighted that as well. So they feel that they're more, the, the service users within their service went to the bottom of the pile. Um, and this last person um, is, is kind of talking about you know, the, the views and the way deaths are reported. So in terms of people being seen as figures and just a reminder that it's a person <laughs> um, to them. And in terms of the service, like, you know, they, they've had this relationship with them for a long time. And, you know, whilst it's not a friend, but they've nursed them over, over time. And then also particularly the impact of losing younger clients and just the emotional impact of that. So really, feeling the need um, to sort of stress that point as well. So these kind of themes came out for people. Um, important to say as well, a lot, a lot, of, um, a lot of staff did also say, um, you know, things that motivated them as well and, and, and ways that um, they were able to contain their frustration and things like that as well. So, um, you know, that they didn't put it over to clients as well. And they, you know, it was an understandable part of the work to experience some of these things, but staff were often um, really, really committed to their work as well. And were able to um, almost have that continual source of compassion as well. So there was both aspects. It's really important to say that there was balance within the sample as well. So finally, in terms of personal achievement, the kind of last area of the Maslach burnout inventory that we, we kind of focused on was crisis driven work. Um, and a general feeling of firefighting um, and it caused that cyclical effect. Um, so this left for some people a feeling that they had limited ability to engage with what they might have described as more meaningful engagement around recovery and helping people reduce um, or abstain from substance use as well. And there was a real balance of costs and rewards of caring work. Um, there was absolutely a clear drive between um, staff to see a drive for progress um, as well. So seeing progress in clients was a real motivator for, for staff in terms of personal achievement. Um, and for some staff where they had re a reduction of personal achievement, they were less able to respond to the demands of their caseload or more complex clients. The need for meaning um, in their work um, and where that didn't exist led to some staff questioning the impact of their work and whether it indeed made a difference. And um, this, this quote is just highlighting the issue about progress as well and where you, you're not seeing change that that can be difficult to process um, as, as a worker as well. So seeing progress as a real motivator. And for some staff it can leave them thinking what's the point and what am I doing? What am I actually doing to help? Staff that felt, um, you know, personal achievement was low as well. Um, this led to them having really negative sort of aspects about the future as well and really seeing a drastic need for change. But also important to say that, um, you know, um, the life-saving aspects of work as well, that absolutely was a motivator for some staff as well. And whilst it was very hard on staff emotionally, people also could cite that it was an amazing feeling if they were able to um, prevent a drug-related death as well. So there was the dual aspects to it. It was emotionally difficult, but also 
um, was a key motivator as well. Feeling valued by managers was a really important aspect as well. Feeling valued by the service, feeling valued within the community as well. And in terms of prevention and support, um, there was an organisational and managerial level and an individual level. So if we talk about individual aspects, people talked to, cited self-care and many sort of aspects within that from like exercise, mindfulness, um, creative writing, various different things like that. And in terms of organisational level, it was really about the organisational culture and management supports as well. Um, these were really key aspects. Workplace counselling was often available to staff that had occupational health support or employee assistance programmes. The main um, challenge with this, because um, it generally evaluated highly, was around time limited. So the maximum amount of sessions was often eight. Um, and for some staff, that maybe wasn't quite enough. Um, for specialist support, such as psychology or certainly support within the community, staff cited that being much more difficult to access. But in terms of waiting times for access and workplace counselling, it was often very quick within a week or two. Um, so that was a real positive for staff as well. And this just gives a wee overview from the quantitative data um, of um, the sorts of areas that people access support from. So supervision was a primary um, source of support for people. Peer support within one's team was also another key aspect, talking to friends and family and uh, you know, other aspects such as resources provided by the service. So things like wellbeing resources, online toolkits, things like that were cited by some staff as well. So a couple of quotes just to kind of um, close and there's just a couple of other aspects that I'll share before I, I'll pass over to the next speaker and um, but I guess this this is a uh, manager's talking about not many staff come forward but it's really important that we do address this as a service and as individual staff members because we can um, look after clients if we're not um, in a good place ourselves as well. Um, some staff cited that they'd never had real sort of follow-up um, for, for other staff, they absolutely had really good debriefing um, systems, but for the staff that didn't, they talked about the impact that that had as well and that cumulative effect. Um, for staff that did have debriefs, there was some aspects to it that, that were problematic um, and really that was about the cumulative aspect rather than the support that was offered. It was basically saying once you've had so many deaths, it, it stops being quite as helpful, some of the debrief things. So there maybe is a need to sort of step up additional supports for staff that have really, really high exposure to this as well. And people talked about the stigma um, of uh, accessing or asking for help um, and worrying about repercussions of this or whether that would affect um, the, their, their work or whether um, how they were viewed in their work as well. Um, and also this pressure that if you're working in a caring role, you need to be okay. Um, and that can be quite difficult as well. So just a few conclusions to sort of finish with as well. So there's, there's a real urgent need uh, to address staff capacity overall, what is an achievable caseload and workload size as well, the training for staff and managers. Stigma was right through all aspects of it and we need to be looking at challenge and stigma on a personal, a cultural and structural level as well. Um, shared understanding of individual staff's remits may help with better partnership working and communication. And maybe there's the, there seemed to be a sense of um, a need to reframe some of the death prevention sort of aspects of work, maintenance and crisis work, um, because I guess the continual exposure to that could really impact on people seeing achievement in their work there. So maybe a need to balance um, those aspects of work with those uh, staff drives for needing to see progress in clients as well. So just be mindful of that. Part of the reframing would be around the communication of the value of staff's work and that contribution to the National Drugs Mission. So, you know, in, in terms of um, saving lives and certainly in terms of recovery, obviously the main step in that direction is about ensuring that people are alive to um, recover. In terms of organisational cultures and management support, so it is promoting those positive cultures as well and a range of management support, so not only formal supports but um, informal as well, and prevention at individual and organisational levels as well. 
and access to support and time off uh, when needed was also important. Okay. So really just to say very briefly, there's similar themes across other research, all the same things that came out, workloads, um, additional working hours during COVID as well, crisis-led support, um, challenges with specialist support. In terms of our um, uh, death prevention work and providing emergency support as well, there was a real need for a, a wide range of supports as well, but particularly management and peer group support came out highest. Similar things from training as well, self-care um, was something that was highlighted as a lot of staff say it's really difficult to prioritise um, this aspect um, where your staff um, caseload is ridiculously high as well, or you've got a lot of staff off sick. Um, so that can be quite difficult to be able to prioritise it as well. And workers were reporting things like not having adequate support systems in place as well to manage as well, and needing that specialist support, um, particularly around mental health and trauma. So that was a very brief uh, tour of some of um, SDF's uh, work around uh, staff burnout in the sector. And just thanks to all the, the different partners that made it possible um, to conduct um, the evaluation and also the different elements of the work that I've mentioned as well. So I'll pass back to Sam. Thank you very much for listening. Thanks, Katie. That was um, really interesting and I think a good way to start hopefully shows the kind of complexity um, of this issue of staff burnout and all the different factors um, and some real powerful insights from um, the quotes there. So what we're going to do next is um, have our first poll question. So I'm hoping that this should pop up on everyone's screen now. Um, so our first question um, is, what is your personal experience of burnout? And there's some quotes there that you can choose which one um, you think would apply to you. Um, so I can feel emotionally exhausted by my work. I can experience feelings of detachment or cynicism towards my work and our people I support or my colleagues. I generally feel a sense of achievement, of personal achievement and or I am effective in my work. So I'm just gonna give it a wee, um, minute or so there um, as people are responding. Thanks to everyone that's um, done it so far. So we're going to um, look at the results um, of those in a bit more depth um, at the end with the panel. So what we're going to do next is um, move on to our next speaker. So I would like to uh, welcome Hannah Carver, who is a lecturer in substance use at the University of Stirling, and she's going to be sharing um, some insights from some of our recent work. So thank you, Hannah. I'll just pass over to you now. Yep. Perfect. Um, so thanks for um, inviting me to come and speak about the research that we've recently conducted around um, stress and well-being during the pandemic um, experienced by homelessness services staff. Um, so I'm going to talk about the findings. And just to say that while the focus is on homelessness services, um, there's definitely a lot of overlap with what Katie had talked about. Um, so there'll be hopefully definitely things that are relevant to those working in substance use and um, related services. So I'm going to talk just very briefly about the background of the studies and then I'll talk about what we did, what we found and then some implications. Just to say this research was funded by the Chief Scientist's Office um, as part of their rapid COVID-19 um, research programme. Um, and it was a six month study that was conducted between May and November 2020. Um, and had ethical approval from the University of Stirling and the Salvation Army. And um, I'm presenting on behalf of a wider team that I'll mention at the end. Um, so just in terms of a background, um, we know that people working in um, homelessness services and providing support to people who are experiencing homelessness are often placed in chaotic and challenging situations on a daily basis which means that there's often high levels of burnout and stress and high staff turnover within these services, but also the challenges of working with people who are traumatised. Um, staff also face the additional challenge of working um, at a time when there's high deaths due to homelessness, as well as drugs and alcohol. Um, and we know that while things are challenging, things like reflective practice, supervisions, meetings with staff, um, and training can have positive effects on staff wellbeing, but they're not often um, consistently provided. Um, 
In terms of the pandemic, it's obviously had massive changes in terms of how things are delivered within the sector and have provided additional challenges for staff, for example, in terms of absences, different ways of working, and also additional concerns for the client group, who um, a lot of whom would be clinically vulnerable. Um, there's also been quite a lot of focus during the pandemic on um, the impact of COVID on people working in frontline um, services in, for example, the NHS. Um, but we um, kind of recognise that those working in third sector services um, and homelessness in particular were often neglected. So that was our kind of rationale for conducting this study. So we conducted a mixed method study um, to look at the experiences of frontline homelessness services staff, so third sector staff, um, during the pandemic, the strategies that they used to support their coping and um, kind of a range of other issues in order to make recommendations for the sector. And we had three um, specific research questions looking at what challenges do people face, how are they coping and what are their support needs, and then what lessons can be learned for the sector in Scotland and beyond, but also to other sectors. So we conducted um, interviews with frontline homelessness services staff across Scotland, um, 18 people in, um, in total. And as I said, that um, these are conducted between June and October 2020. So really in the kind of very early stages of the pandemic when things were pretty um, chaotic. These interviews were conducted um, by phone and online um, and lasted about 60 minutes um, in total for each one. And they looked at people's experiences of stress and well-being, their coping strategies, um, their need for support and recommendations for the future. And then we audio recorded these, analysed them. And we also, um, the, the data analysis was informed by a particular model of um, stress and coping called the revised transactional model of occupational stress and coping. And I'm not going to say too much about that, but just to say it's a way of understanding how people experience stress um, and coping strategies in occupational settings. So it's not specific to homelessness, but can be applied across a range of um, different um, sectors. So it kind of assumes that when someone experiences a stressful event, um, for example, working within homelessness services might have particular events, they consider what coping resources that they might have. Um, and then when stress res levels are raised, they will either use problem focused or emotional focused coping and if these strategies don't work then stress levels will continue to increase um, especially when someone experiences another stressful event so it helped us to understand um, how people's experiences prior to the pandemic are going to be um, further impacted um, through, by working within the pandemic and as well as interviews, we asked all of our participants to, um, to fill out the Maslach burnout inventory, which um, was also used in the work Katie talked about. Um, and it's a measure of occupational burnout and obviously includes things around emotional um, exhaustion, depersonalisation and personal accomplishment. Um, and we um, analysed using descriptive statistics. And just to say, only eight, 11 of the 18 people conduct, um, filled out this um, survey so it wasn't a whole sample approach. So I'm just going to quickly go through um, the interview findings first and then talk about the um, Maslach burnout inventory findings. So the themes from the interviews um, were split into two um, higher, higher order themes where the first one talking about pre-pandemic experiences, so what were people's experiences, and then I'm going to focus much more on their experiences during the pandemic. So by, before the um, pandemic started, we asked people about their experiences of working in their roles. And they described um, the emotional impact of the role um, and the challenges of working within a complex system. Um, in terms of substance use, people talked about um, frustration about disagreement around harm reduction um, practices and a concern about um, things around management's um, lack of responses to, for example, unethical practice. Um, within a staff team um, and that's highlighted um, in the second quote from Chris. Um, staff talked about having generally quite good relationships with their clients um, and they, um, as you can see in the quote from Lindsay here, and um, 
there was also a discussion about a kind of variety of different workplace cultures. So some had really positive experiences um, prior to the pandemic, where there was a reflective culture, approachable managers, flexible working, supportive teams, um, whereas others had really negative experiences, for example, having high staff turnover, understaffed services, punitive absence policies and poor relationships with management. So a kind of mixed bag in terms of how people experienced their um, settings before the pandemic started. So then we asked what, what their experiences of the pandemic. So despite the kind of challenges of working on the front line during these early months, um, people did talk about positive things. So one of the main things was when vacant hotels were converted into emergency accommodation. Staff saw these as having positive impacts for clients um, and also in, uh, encouraging there to be a greater focus on client involvement in how services were operating. And people also felt empowered to provide feedback themselves to organisations about how services were delivered and the work that was being done and also had more support from um, managers and had this kind of sense of solidarity where everyone was in it together. In terms of working with their client group during the pandemic, um, there were obvious challenges related to new ways of working and ensuring continuity of support and maintaining relationships when people couldn't really kind of do face-to-face -face work. Many people talked about the, how difficult it was explaining the seriousness of the pandemic to clients, um, especially for many who felt that society didn't care about them, so why would they care about themselves? And also others talked about the use of um, PPE, so mostly masks and um, kind of gloves as a barrier to providing emotional um, support to people and how it kind of meant that it was really difficult to build relationships when there was this kind of physical barrier. In terms of organisational culture, um, the pandemic seemed to act as a magnifying glass for pre-existing positive and negative organisational cultures and practices. So in the positive services, um, stronger bonds between team members and with managers were reported. But in the other services where there was more negativity before the pandemic, there seemed to be a them and us culture experienced by staff, where frontline staff talked really um, frustratedly at having to remain on the front line when management just said, see you later, we're off to work at home, we'll be, we'll be kept safe. And the quote from Margaret really kind of highlights that. It's the people who get paid the least that are working the hardest and having to, to put their health and safety on the line. Um, participants also talked about particular aspects um, of things that helped um, to mediate their stress during the pandemic. So things like reflective practice, supervision, training, and this or overall organizational ethos were viewed positively. Also informal peer support, supervision, um, and reflective practice sessions between staff and within staff teams existed, um, as well as services um, had more formal supervision with line managers or with external staff like clinical psychologists. And staff also noted that informal reflection via impromptu discussions with managers were really valued at kind of getting them to um, opportunities for them to be able to talk about what was bothering them. Um, we also asked people about how they coped before and during the pandemic and lots of people said that they found it really difficult to switch off from work. To do so, they talked about things like meditation, mindfulness, breathing exercises, getting out in nature, exercise, spending time with family and friends, um, and annual leave. And people talked about how difficult it was to maybe carry on with these things during the pandemic um, and talked about more kind of um, negative coping strategies as well. In terms of recommendations for the future, staff talked about um, the need for improved pay and conditions within the sector, ensuring that staff could take annual leave because this was really challenging during the um, initial part of the pandemic, and the need to prioritise staff wellbeing and also providing proper reflective practice, good supervision and counselling when necessary. Um, in terms of the um, Maslach burnout inventory findings, um, as I said, there was only 11 participants, but most participants showed low levels of emotional exhaustion and depersonalisation and moderate levels of personal accomplishment. So that means that um, while some of the scores were low, most of them were kind of approaching the moderate level 
and two people had quite high scores for emotional exhaustion and depersonalization, which is suggesting potential burnout for them. So the findings indicate that um, most people were not currently experiencing burnout, but might be at um, increased risk in the future if the issues um, that were addressed during the interviews were left um, unaddressed. And also just obviously it's a small sample, so we can only say so much, but you can see there's def um, definite links with the work that Katie presented. Um, in terms of implications for policy practice and research, um, this study provides a novel understanding of the experiences of frontline homelessness services staff regarding their well-being and stress during the early pandemic. And there's implications um, in terms of how staff are supported. And they're not necessarily um, specific to working within the pandemic, but um, they appear to be more important um, at this time and should be prioritised. So reflective practice seems to be really important and can be embedded within organisational culture. So it's not just a kind of tag on um, and it should be provided by someone who's well trained and is external to the staff team and management. Um, service managers can also be supported to work closely with their staff to ensure there's clear communication and to encourage staff to have flexibility and autonomy in their roles as this was really valued. Um, there needs to be opportunities for formal and informal communication with staff so that staff feel that they're, they're listened to and supported. Um, staff should be encouraged to um, develop a sense of solidarity between service managers, staff and clients, uh, which can be done via reflective cultures, team building and good communication. And there's also the importance of ensuring staff are protected from exhaustion through, for example, encouraging people to take their annual leave um, when, when required um, to ensure they're getting enough time off. And obviously this research was relatively um, small and done really quickly at the start of the pandemic. So more research is needed to find out whether there's a longer term impact of um, working in the pandemic on people's um, well-being and stress and burnout. So this was conducted in 2020 to be interesting to know where things are at now. Um, so just to conclude, um, obviously the pandemic had a huge impact on people's experiences of well-being and stress. It magnified certain aspects of services, so teams became stronger in some settings, but they became fragmented in others. Um, and it seems that the organisational culture had such a um, big impact on people's experiences of stress and also on their coping skills. And as I said, more re research is needed in this area as it's um, quite rather neglected. Um, just to finally say thanks to um, the other members of my research, research team, um, to our research advisory group of Adam Burley, Emma Williamson and Andrew McCall. And obviously a big thanks to all the participants who participated and the organisations who supported the recruitment. Um, and just also to say that we published our paper um, of the findings last week. So if anybody wants a copy, they can either Google the title and it'll come up when it's open access, or you can email me or um, contact me on Twitter and I can send you a copy. So thanks. Thank you, Hannah. That was great. Another really interesting um, piece of work there. And yeah, what we can maybe try and do, we will send out an evaluation um, after the webinar for people to give us some feedback. So we can maybe see about including the link in there or making it accessible to people so that people can access Hannah's full paper. Um, and I think we're going to go on to our next poll question. Yep. So this is what are the single, sorry, what are the biggest challenges affecting staff burnout in the sector? You can just pick one. Um, so which one you think is the, the biggest challenge, I suppose. Um, so exposure to high rates of drug-related deaths and non-fatal overdoses, high caseload size, staff shortages, lack of specialist training needed to support clients effectively, lack of resources and specialist supports or services to refer clients to, challenges of working with a marginalised client group involving complex needs, or the pandemic. End. So we're now moving on to our next presentation, um, which is from Gwen Harrison, who is currently the local support fund manager here at SDF, um, but is speaking here on behalf of the Highland Flood Sector Interface. The following highlights some of the main points captured through general discussion, experiences and the key messages from a series of four focus groups conducted across November and December 2020 about the impact of the pandemic on third sector staff and service users in Highland. 
The sessions explored the impacts, positive and negative, which related to the pandemic on the third sector. The groups were facilitated by me as the third sector representative on the CPP Mental Health and Wellbeing subgroup and supported by Mary Wiley, the Chief Officer at Highland Third Sector Interface. The report was not seen as representing a full picture of the whole third sector experience, but rather a snapshot of key themes and concerns with a specific focus on the Highland experience. For today's event, I'm going to concentrate on four elements. A general context on Highland perspective, the impact on staff and volunteers, the impact on third sector managers and points for future consideration. So just to set some context and some key messages from a Highland perspective, covering an area 20% larger than Wales, roughly about the size of Belgium and the largest local authority area in the whole of the UK, Highland has a population of around 235,000 people, with approximately a quarter of these living in and around the Inverness area. This means that they have the challenge of a vast remote rural population and a centralised, more urban area too. Highland already had some pre-existing challenges relating to isolation, loneliness and inclusivity. The pandemic has exacerbated these, but equally there were also opportunities to develop responses because of the groundwork and focus which was already in place. There were concerns emerging that the pandemic would create an environment where the funding landscape would become too specialised and too specific in responding to more national perceptions of need informed by the impacts of lockdown, restrictions of the pandemic and some of the other issues which emerged due to and because of the pandemic. This most certainly includes an emphasis on services which relate to mental health and other cross-cutting or linked issues including trauma, substance use, suicide and poverty. This would be instead of allowing communities and organisations to respond to needs which specifically relate to the beneficiaries they work with which for remote and rural communities can be quite different and often broader, a broader mix due to the population. Mm. So first to look at the staff and volunteer element. Communication was noted as a significant issue in several ways. There was a lot of interest in the recurring theme that individuals who have been until now relatively resilient in terms of their own mental health and wellbeing and have not really had to give much consideration either to ongoing mental health issues or how to manage and maintain good mental health are now possibly those who are struggling most notably now as they did not have coping strategies already in place. Several reflections were made about staff responding in the first, first month, month or two of the pandemic in a wave of adrenaline conscious of pressures of time and hyper awareness of community needs. The energy utilised within that initial phase was described as evaporating more and more as the time extended and restrictions were prolonged and particularly the return to stricter restrictions at the end of summer 2020. This sense of no end in sight was a recurring theme. There was a general sense of exhaustion emerging from within staff teams, replacing that initial adrenaline fueled activity. Here are some quotes from staff members. Reflections both personal and about colleagues being that this initial pace of response and entering crisis mode had driven development of bad habits in relation to personal timekeeping and maintaining boundaries, both within teams and with service users. Concerns were raised around the pressure individuals felt to respond to emails, phone calls and other general inquiries rapidly or instantaneously. This wasn't necessarily the case before going into working from home practices um, during lockdown. There were a number of reflections around the sense that people could go from one online meeting directly into another online meeting without any or very little break in between. This is a sharp contrast to some of the practices that people had pre-COVID where travel time between meetings allowed us to 
take time to digest, to decompress and to prepare for the next meeting or discussion. It is perfectly possible now to go from one meeting to another for the majority of the day without potentially any sort of substantive break. Um, and another quote from a, a staff member. So the staff talked about their experiences of delivering support services from home as being like service users moving in. With staff and there were concerns about the inability to create appropriate boundaries between work life and home. Though acknowledging that this can also mean recognising that work can be as important to support and health and home life practice, home life practice too. This group explored some of the experiences today, as well as concerns over returning to something more normal and fears around these erosion of skills which were previously taken for granted. So specifically, but not limited to social skills and routine work tasks that they had previously formed a significant part of, of the work and role had unexpectedly um, challenged uh, this one participant when she had undertaken to resume some face-to-face -face support. Um, moving on to the manager element. So third sector managers felt very protective of their staff teams, but this generated an immense sense of pressure to support staff and minimise the effect of negative impacts on them. They talked about the need to have a constantly upbeat, positive and optimistic facade, even at times when they most certainly didn't feel that way, and the drain that this had on them personally. It was recognised that maintaining morale was most definitely part of their role, and that on occasion it was very difficult to continually attempt to bolster and maintain it in the absence of the energy and the feedback that they would routinely have as part of their um, in-person interactions that they were having, you know, when it was face to face. They described a one way flow of energy, which was just leaving them exhausted. And there was a clear concern about this being a real pressure point. I know personally, um, coming from a manager role, I, I can reflect that I frequently said things like, this isn't working from home, um, I'm actually living at work. And I guess as a manager, you just weren't getting to, to switch off. It felt like there was a real, a lack of a real understanding of the pressures which existed for managers of third sector organisations <clears throat> and how the those circumstances were impacting on them, their workload and on their morale. Concerns were also made in relation to staff sickness levels, um, unconnected to the virus directly, but arising from the ongoing working practice and general wearing down of individual resilience and a negative impact on staff, mental health and wellbeing. In terms of inter-team communication, there are some real advantages. Um, People were definitely making more of an effort to talk to one another and the digital environment helped individuals who previously had worked at a distance from team members to keep in touch much more effectively. There was a relative consensus that the time now required to manage staff was much more than was required prior to the pandemic and the restrictions. Specifically, just general communications and catch-ups taking a lot longer and having to be done very much on a one-to-one -one basis. There was a real sense of agreement around the question, who supports me? Concerns were raised also that good governance practices, tasks and responsibilities ordinarily delegated explicitly or implicitly to the senior officer were not being maintained or addressed as they could or should be due to the increasing time pressures. So some summary points. Um, firstly, from a more general and Highland perspective, throughout all four focus groups, to a greater or lesser extent, concern was raised around the capacity of current public sector services in relation to supporting mental health with a general sense that there is just not sufficient capacity to meet demand more generally, but also more specifically for the prevention of a growing escalation in suicidal ideation and action. The advantages of better collaboration and more participation both within Highland and, 
and nationally were also noted and it was proposed that there should be some resistance to returning to meetings that were structured only around the larger population centres. Embracing digital technology would mean that a more equal participation can exist between people in different geographies. Summary points from a staff and a volunteer perspective. So the, the, the skills and the confidence developed in using digital technology throughout 2020 has been seen as a really significant benefit and a shift in practice. And there is a general desire that this should be blended with more traditional approaches in the future to ensure that all the opportunities and benefits it presents are not lost. Another point that felt it needed consideration was the skills attrition. Phased return, revisiting and practice of core skills required for staff confidence, which in many cases were things that they had routinely taken for granted previously. And the impact of not doing these for such extended periods of time has impacted on their confidence. Um, and we need to be more effective at making time within our calendars to allow breaks between meetings. Some summary points from a manager perspective. There was some reflection on the need for managers to encourage individuals to ensure that they are respectful of other colleagues' time and to check their availability prior to attempting to contact each other and being conscious that they're not creating a pressure to respond based on an assumption that people should be available because they are sitting in front of their computers at home. Concerns over a lack of appropriate support for managers at a comparable level to what they provide for staff, as well as the ability to maintain good governance practices, may be areas that boards need to consider and respond to moving forward. Lastly, um, just some questions and some discussion points. This piece of work has been very much focused from a Highland third sector perspective. But just to pose the question, if some of these points would also chime with experiences from elsewhere and different locations, different environments and sectors. How do we manage to keep the good changes in place? Do we need to make sure that staff are trained and supported to be better at remote working if it continues? Will we see rising absence rates in staff and managers as the impact of burnout is felt, if not mitigated against? Will there be governance and safeguarding issues arising from lack of review and oversight of policy and implementation due to time restraints, additional workloads and pressures? Thanks for listening. Thanks to Gwen there for sharing that and another really um, interesting insight there. Um, so before we move on to our last poll question, um, I just want to mention um, another piece of work that's been going on from the Scottish Government who have been doing a piece of research to better understand the drug and alcohol workforce in Scotland, including looking at factors such as resilience within the workforce. Um, so there'll be a report released on that on the 31st of March. Um, and it should be available on the Scottish Government website. So that's another thing to look out for. And I'm sure SDF will be um, maybe sharing that um, on our social medias and things as well. So I'm just going to ask Lisa to open the last poll question. We've all got the gist of this now. So again, this is a single choice. So what is my main source of support to deal with challenges from my work? So supervision with lane manager, peer support, talking to friends and family, group supervision, self-help or online support, resources provided by service, self-care strategies and privately accessed support. Um, and I will now pass over to our final presentation, um, which is from Adrian Hanna, um, another of my colleagues at SDF. And Adrian is the team leader for our harm reduction um, team within the sexual health and bloodborne virus team at SDF. So over to you, Adrian. Thanks, Sam. So as Sam said, I am uh, working for STF within the Sexual Health, Bloodborne Virus and Harm Reduction team. But today I'm going to talk to you with my mindfulness teacher hat on. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about mindfulness and creative writing that I've been involved in over the whole of the pandemic, using them as tools for self-care. Thanks, Luke. Next slide, please. 
So this is what I'm going to do over the next 15 minutes or so. Talk a little bit about mindfulness, a little bit about mindfulness and burnout. Uh, tell you something about the mindfulness and creative writing that I've been involved in. And then I am going to invite you to join me, if you would like to, in a short mindfulness, probably about 10 minutes of a mindfulness practice. Thanks, Luke. So what is mindfulness? I'm sure probably a lot of you are already practicing mindfulness and certainly you'll have heard a lot about it. But here's what the Mindfulness Association, um, how it defines mindfulness. So a life skill, which can deepen your sense of well-being, um, that whole idea of paying attention to what's happening in your present moment experience, which probably make you smile, but just as I was coming on there, I was thinking my heart's beating, I'm feeling nervous coming on to do this presentation, and I thought, right, let me just practice some mindfulness and do some deep breathing, which always helps. But for me, mindfulness really is about noticing what's happening, when it's happening, without any sense of judgment or preference. So that might be you know, on a lovely day like today, being out in nature and really enjoying nature. So looking at what's around you, um, maybe even listening to the birds singing. Perhaps at this time of year, you might notice some of the lovely smells that are around. I always notice when the wild garlic starts to grow because it's got that lovely, lovely garlicky smell. Um, but it's also about touch, it's also about taste, it's about our five senses really, and using our five senses to be in the present moment. And I suppose it's worth considering why is it important to be in the present moment? And it is important for our mental health because if we just stop at any time, we can notice that our body is still but our mind is wandering off somewhere. And you'll probably know whether or not you are, or you have the kind of mind that ruminates about the past, or you have the kind of mind that worries about the future. We can't change the past, um, and we don't know what the future will bring. And so from a mental health point of view, it's actually better for us just to be in the present moment. I've already said the thing about being out in nature, which is lovely, but there are lots of other little mindfulness things that you can do just in everyday life. So things like when you have a shower, when you brush your teeth, if you regularly climb up and down stairs, actually noticing what you're doing at the moment. I, I live two floors up in a tenement block. And what I try to do is when I'm climbing the stairs, coming back home from somewhere, rather than thinking about where I've been or wondering about what I'm going to do when I get into my flat, I actually try and just be climbing the stairs and noticing the impact that that is having on my body. And that's really what mindfulness is about. And it's what I find is the more you practice it, of course, the better you get. Someone says it's a bit like learning a new language. And it is a bit like that. Um, but the more you practice it, the more you notice um, and the better it seems to be for you. So, Luke, would you mind giving me the next slide? Thank you. So we've heard a lot about burnout this afternoon. And what we know is that mindfulness can be very helpful in terms of both um, preventing burnout, but also noticing burnout. Um, and when we notice and acknowledge and recognize how we're feeling, that is so important in terms of burnout. Because if we're not aware of how we're feeling, how can we possibly seek support? Um, and you'll see here the suggestion being that if we seek support in time, 
it can be the difference between taking a few days off work to rest and being forced to take a long absence because of severe burnout. Next slide, please, Luke. So this is what mindfulness can do um, in terms of burnout. We become more aware of subtle changes in our mood and physical health. And Katie was even mentioning that right back in the first presentation, how people said that burnout didn't just affect their mental health, but also affected their physical health. And rather than waiting until we get to that point of no return almost, mindfulness can really get in there and help us deal with our jobs, which are very challenging and have been particularly challenging as we've heard during the pandemic. Next slide, please, Luke. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about mindfulness and creative writing that I've been involved in um, over the time of the pandemic. As I've said, I am a mindfulness teacher as well as my full-time job at SDF. And at the start of lockdown, I spoke to a friend and colleague of mine, Bev Schofield, who is a creative writing facilitator. And we talked about the fact that people really needed something to support their mental health, but weren't able to join groups for mindfulness or attend groups for creative writing. And so what we did was we decided that perhaps we could join the two things together. And in July, 2020, we ran our first online eight week mindfulness and creative writing course. The feedback was incredible actually for lots of reasons. People found the connecting with other people, even online connecting was good. We had people from seven different countries coming to our sessions. So there were links with other parts of the world which had stopped because of the pandemic. Um, and since July, 2020, we've now run six eight week courses, usually on a Saturday morning. Um, and the layout tends to be, we've got two hours together. We usually start with welcoming and then we'll do a mindfulness practice. We'll have a little break and then Bev will lead people in a session of writing. And then there's time at the end if people want to share what they've written. No pressure, but they can if they want to. Next slide, please, Luke. So I just want to say a little bit about Bev. She is with an organization called Lapidus Scotland. If you haven't heard of them, have a wee Google. They're a really interesting organization. Um, so what Lapidus does is it looks to explore and expand knowledge and understanding of the value of words. And it offers reading and writing activities to promote health and well-being. So you can see that fits very, very well with mindfulness. I've just, just to let you know, I've just had a wee message from Katie to say that our mindfulness practice can only be five minutes. Um, we're obviously running out of time today. So I will quickly just move on to that. And look, if you don't mind sharing my next slide. Um, so this, I just wanted to give you a flavour of the kind of feedback that we're getting from people. Um, this was one of the women who's attended a few of our group sessions. I'll read it out just in case it's not clear. And what she said is, thank you for your encouragement these last months. I've been going through a deep depression and your class has helped me keep going. I wasn't going to come today as I felt I had nothing to bring. Then at the last minute, I thought I'll come for the meditation. Then I thought I'll stay for the poem. Then I thought I've nothing to share. Then I scratched my head and you asked me to read. And if I can just explain that to you, I said about Bev encouraging people to share um, what they've written. And if you make the slightest movement, she, raise your hand, scratch your head, whatever, Bev will be on you and asking you if you want to actually share what you've written. And this woman actually did share what she'd written, even though she started off feeling pretty bad at the start of the session. She, she goes on to say, 
I was so surprised by your response, but the group is so encouraging. The women are so honest and brave. Mental health is so important to care for. And that's the kind of feedback that we've been getting um, throughout the time of running these sessions. And my next slide, please, Luke. So this is a beautiful picture. I think it's a beautiful picture actually taken by Bev of sunset over Easdale Island. And I'm going to use that as the backdrop to lead you in a short five minute mindfulness practice. Um, I've put it there because if you would like to, you can look at that lovely picture or you may just prefer to close your eyes. This is optional, of course, joining in um, with five minutes of mindfulness. But if you would like to join in, you're very welcome. So here we go. I would encourage you just simply to get comfortable wherever you are sitting. Let your body be supported by your chair and your ground. Choose if you're going to close your eyes or you're going to look at a lovely picture. And simply notice that your body is here. Your body is here in this present moment. And encourage your mind to be here with your body. Noticing your breath can be very helpful in settling your mind. So you might just notice your body breathing. Feeling your breath coming in and going out of your body. Usually you can feel your breath at your nostrils cool air coming in and warmer air going out. And maybe even just deepen your breath ever so slightly. So really feeling that in breath and that out breath. Your mind might still wander off, and that's fine. Just come back to your breath whenever you notice your, mind, your mind's wandered. Feeling your breath, cool air coming into your nostrils, warmer air leaving your nostrils. And then you might allow your attention to drop down into your body, noticing how your body is feeling right now. Feeling your feet on the ground, noticing how your feet are feeling. Working your way up your legs, Noticing how your legs and your knees are feeling. Feeling your bum, your sitting bones on the chair. Just feeling that contact between your body and the chair supporting you. Moving up maybe to your shoulders, noticing how your shoulders are feeling. Allowing a little bit of relaxation if you need to. Noticing your arms and your hands. Maybe a sense of tingling in your hands. Just noticing what's there. Moving up to your head and your neck. 
Again, just noticing any feelings or sensations in this part of your body. And then gently coming back to your breath. Feeling your breath coming in and going out of your nostrils. And then just as we finish this short practice, just taking a moment to thank yourself for trying out a bit of mindfulness. And you might like to open your eyes and look, if you don't mind, just moving on to my last slide. So I've just put my email address up there, adrian at sdf.org.uk. If you're interested in mindfulness and creative writing, please do get in touch and I'll put your name on the list for our next course. Thank you. Thank you, Adrian. That was great. Something a bit different um, there. And hopefully people found that um, useful. Um, and but that you've you're still with us. Nobody's fallen asleep, um, particularly the panel, because I'm now going to call on the panel to um, switch their cameras on and I will be introducing them. And then we're going to talk a little bit about their perspectives and also the, um, the questions that we've had submitted, as well as um, talk about the polls. So um, I'm just going to very quickly um, mention who we've got and then I will go around each person and ask them to give us um, just a quick perspective and reflections on um, the area of the sector and burnout and what their thoughts on that are. So um, we have two people joining us from the Connect for Change team, um, which is a multidisciplinary addiction intensive support team. So we have Carolyn Walker, who is a charge nurse, and Debbie Darby, who's a peer recovery worker there. We have Vered Hopkins, who's the lead officer for protecting people in the substance use and humanitarian protection team at Dundee ADP. Phil Heaton, who's the policy officer at Fife ADP, um, and Will McCauley, um, who's the harm reduction practitioner at the Glasgow and Lanarkshire overdose response team. Hopefully I got all of that correct. So I'm going to come to Carolyn um, and Debbie first. So if you could give us some insight, maybe just from the perspective of a nurse and a peer worker, about your thoughts on burnout um, and experiences of that um, recently in the sector. I think um, for myself, because um, at the moment I'm sort of straddling two of the sectors because um, because it's a new pilot, it was a pilot project that literally got set up weeks before the pandemic started. So. At the moment, I'm still in the CAT team, but I'm working in the third sector. I'm based in the third sector, so I've been sort of straddling in both areas. And I could see when the Katie was doing the figures about the difference between NHS staff burnout and third sector burnout, and I can actually see that for myself, the difference between the two. So I think we found that because um, when we were starting as a, a, as a pilot project doing the intensive support, that we couldn't go ahead as normal because of the um, because of the COVID, but we're still having to produce figures and um, statistics to back up why we should still be commissioned. So I think there was a lot of pressure on us to sort of um, get on with that. And also um, for me personally, the fact I was being managed by two different people as well, and one person was wanting me to work through this at NHS way of things and the manager down here it was it was completely different so um I found from that and we were still seeing people face to face and doing a search of outreach throughout the whole of the pandemic as well which was pretty stressful because of the the um lockdowns and PPE and the the fear of getting COVID and things like that and yeah I don't know if that makes sense but you get in to see them yeah um I think for me, just a, a lot of the stuff that was discussed um, at the beginning really got me thinking. So this is actually my, my first job um, in the sector since getting clean and sober. So I've been here about 14 months now. Um, 
And I haven't experienced burnout as such, but I think you put so much of yourself into your clients on a daily basis that I definitely think it's had an impact in my attitude outside work. Like, I, I'm not quite so, what's the word? Not quite so empathetic to, like, my kids or friends and family that might come to me with a problem because you've just put so much in throughout the day that when you, you go home, you know, you, I suppose it is, it's just highlighted to me, it's emotional exhaustion. Um, so, yeah, that, that was really good that you put that into words. <laughs> I have experienced, yeah, sorry, I have experienced burnout. I had to go off in November. Um, I ended up in hospital through sort of heart problems and it's all been, it's been related to stress. So I had to take three months out and I've been back now for about five weeks. So it, the, there was an impact on myself with sort of cardiac issues through the stress, uh, um, sort of doing the, the, the role that I've got. So, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for um, sharing that with us. So we'll come back to you um, shortly. So Vered, if I could come to you next and just ask for, yeah, um, <coughs> your perspective on your area of the sector um, on burnout. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so for somebody who's working, somebody who's working in the strategic level at a local area, first of all, I'm grateful um, uh, for SDF and Katie for, for having conducted the research in Dundee. Um, I think this is very, the, the broader um, issue here is the, the duty of care that we have towards staff uh, within, working within the area, um, both in the third sector and in the public sector. Um, and in my view, I mean, obviously, I think the pandemic, as, as it was said, has, has perhaps um, sh shone a light on the issues, but um, the issues have, of burnout have been there before and I think specifically for individuals, for staff that are working um, with individuals who are very often have complex needs, um, they, are, they are affected by childhood and ongoing trauma and it takes a long, long time to, to see progress and to, 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 for individuals to experience recovery. Um, I think burnout is a particular issue and it always, and, and I think it has been for a long time. I think as we progress to understand the, the role of trauma and as we progress with focusing on trauma-informed work around the individuals with lived experience, we are also able to recognize and work around the, the trauma and the burnout that is experienced by staff because I think that is connected. I am particularly interested in the, the notion of deeper personalization that Katie has highlighted in her research. And within that, the, the impact that that has on the ability of, or the, the effectiveness of the public sector organizations and third sector organizations working together, I think that's a massive issue. I think the fact that very often um, organizations are unable to support each other, unable to work uh, together effectively enough, means that the whole, the whole area of service provision and our ability to support individuals um, is less effective. So I'm very keen um, for myself uh, and in Dundee that we, um, that we focus on that. And the last thing I would say is that there is an awful lot for us, for those of us working in the area of substance use, and I will include alcohol use here as well, not just drugs, there is a lot for us to learn from, from those who are working in other areas of vulnerabilities in terms of how we address staff burnout and how we perhaps act, um, act on the duty of care that we have for staff. For example, in the area of violence against women, there's far more recognition of um, the impact that staff experience when they work with individuals who themselves are, um, are affected by trauma, really difficult um, life experiences and very, very challenging situations. And over a long period of time, um, that builds up to, to, to burnout. So I think there's a lot for us to learn from those areas as well. And I'd like to progress that too. I think for now, that's, that's it for me. 
Thank you. Um, and Phil, I'll just come to you next if you could maybe just give um, a bit of your perspective um, from, yeah, from again from the ADP. Thanks, Sam. Um, yeah, so I wasn't really sure what I was going to say, to be honest with you, because there's a bit of a first world problems um, with, with um, you know, my job, I guess, uh, sat in my house all day. But I, you know, I've done, I've been in this this field for about 20 years and I've, I've worked in all different aspects of it. And I've experienced burnout and I've and I've seen other people go through burnout as well, both as a frontline worker and as a more backroom strategy um, worker as well. And it was really interesting to listen to Katie speaking on, on her um, presentation at the start and a lot of the stuff that, that Katie was um, talking about really chimed with me um, and all about the, the, the compassion fatigue and I suffer quite heavily from imposter syndrome. I'm, I'm constantly terrified that I'm going to get found out any, any day that I don't really know much about what I do. It's, you know, it's, um, but I think that there's a lot of stigma around burnout. We, we talk about people being burned out in a kind of derisory way, um, which prevents people when they do feel burnt out from actually asking for help um, to, to, to get the support. Um, one of the things that I've noticed in, uh, during the lockdown and working from home is that, um, and I can't remember the name of the, the person who did the presentation, but the, the, the phrase, um, you're not working from home, you're living at work, that really stuck with me because that was such so, so real. And I find myself at half six in the morning compelled to do emails. I find myself at the weekend compelled to do emails. And it's almost like you're trying to prove that you are at work. Um, so there's a constant stress that's niggling away in the background. So there's lots of different aspects to this. There's no one size fits all. Uh, and I think it's important we realise that and it does come in all different forms. Um, so, yeah, that's all I'd like to say just now. Thanks. Um, and Will, I'll just come to you as well. If you could just give a bit of your input from think about in terms of the overdose response team. Yeah, thanks very much, uh, um, Samantha. Um, really, for what everybody's said just kind of um, sort of resonates. I think that, you know, fighting fires in work and then kind of starting them at home sometimes can be can be quite difficult. Um, you're plowing so much emotional energy into what you're doing day to day when you when you know when you come home to, you know, partner and kids. Sometimes um, somebody else had said you can kind of feel a bit a bit detached, you, you know, just needing to um, kind of unpack your your um, your, your own mind. Um, our service uh, was kind of part of a sort of taste of change. So, um, you know that kind of frustration at times where um, things weren't going to plan. Uh, again, as 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 Phil had said, sometimes when it's quiet, you feel you need to justify what you're doing when it's quiet, rather than actually just taking some of that time to recharge your batteries a bit, you're maybe scrambling for, for kind of things to do or seem to be busy all the time, which I think is probably, um, you know, it's, 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 it's really, really difficult. And it is, it's, a, it's, a, it's an absolute, you know, it can be a, a drain on your, your mind. And then just kind of self-care over the last two years, that's something that I've really had to, had to work on. And whether that is cold water therapy, nutrition, you know, mindfulness, meditation, all of that kind of stuff, I think, can have a, a more positive impact in your, your well-being. Uh, we were doing a set of outreach and you're maybe grabbing, you know, uh, unhealthy food and loads and loads of sugar and you're going through that absolute peak and trough cycle when you're working. That's something I've kind of had to, had to um, work on in, in terms of you know, sort of preserving myself for, for the, the, the working week. But, um, yeah, super, super relevant, obviously affecting a, a lot of people. And, um, yeah, that's that's kind of my, my perspective on it. Great. Thank you. And thank you all for your, your kind of honesty there about your own experiences and your insights. Um, what we're going to try to do, I think, is share the responses to the polls. I don't know if Lisa will be able to make those pop up. If not, I've got them and I can just see what it was oh here we go so question one hopefully you can all see that was about the personal experience and you'll all be able to see there that 51 percent of um people who responded that are actually here today said that they can feel emotionally exhausted by their work that's obviously the majority so that is quite an alarming um result i'd say so i just want to ask 
what do we need to do organisationally and in the sector to respond to this? I um, don't know if anyone wants to come in or... Bernard, I can maybe come to you. Sorry to put you on the spot there. <laughs> Yeah, that's you. I think I've managed to unmute myself. Yeah, yeah. yeah thank you. <laughs> um, I completely agree, Samantha, that this is this is quite um, an alarming uh, result for the for the um, poll. I think, first of all, um, the first stage is, or the first the first step is to to recognise that this is an issue. Um, and as Phil has already said, uh, there is an issue of people not um, able to come forward. Uh, and, and the stigma around um, experiencing burnout. Um, and I think that's something that's probably one of the first thing that we, that we um, at a local level need to start thinking about it and how we, how we make it much easier, how we address the stigma around people feeling not okay um, at work. Um, I think some of the issues um, are to do with, with the, the, the workload and the, the amount of work that people that people have, and perhaps especially in the in the public sector, people feel that they don't have a lot of room to prioritize their work. Um, people feel that they are not uh, in control of their workload, and and they don't have a lot of options in terms of what they do. And I think all of these issues we need to to uh, recognize and address. Um, and for me, all of that is part of organizations become, becoming much more trauma informed. And by trauma informed, I mean, of course, recognizing that the individuals we work with and the, the individuals we are here to support and, and help progress, um, the reasons very often, the, the reasons that people really find it challenging to progress with their lives is because of past and ongoing trauma in their lives. Um, and I think very often, in, and especially in the substance use world, we focus a lot on the, on the actual activities of substance use rather than on the underlying causes which are um, more related to trauma. And I think the same approach need to, to, to be taken um, when we are working around staff burnout. Um, I think the two go hand in hand. Great, thank you. Um, and we've had a comment um, that kind of ties in with this and saying, I feel there is a real lack of support around drug-related deaths, that we should just accept it and move on and not make a fuss. Um, and this person said that they're paying privately for their support and um, so they don't feel they've received it in their workplace. So I wonder if, Will, I could bring you in, if you've got any comment about that type of experience and also with the emotional exhaustion being... Um, experienced by over half of our people here, if you could comment on that. I think um, you're walking into situations and, you know, it feels hopeless, living condition seems, you know, terrible. Um, you know, there's that digital poverty, financial poverty, you know, and and it is it's difficult. Somebody said that they're paying for their own treatment, you know, all of that. You know, you're 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 feeling the burden of that, and you're you're taking that away. And I think there is a kind of a, a sense of hopelessness that just drains, you know, f from from your own uh, tank, uh, if you like. And it can be, you know, really really difficult. Um, that there's no kind of quick fix for for these things. And I think in terms of um, signposting people to different services and, and that, are, you know, everybody seems to be experiencing what you're experiencing. People are short-staffed, people are off with COVID, people are off with stress, and it does just kind of create quite a difficult working environment at times. Um, and and as yeah, it's, it's, it's really, really, really challenging. Yep, thanks. Um, and sorry, I feel like I'm really whizzing through this, but we are... Um, just going to have kind of maybe five um, minutes left or so. So if we could just bring up the next poll result, Lisa. We've got a couple of questions that tie into that, I think. So this was about um, the biggest challenges. So we can see here that there was quite a mix of responses, but the biggest ones kind of being high caseload size, staff shortages and lack of resources and specialist supports um, to refer clients to. So, um, 
Phil, I'm going to come to you now with a question um, that someone has put in a comment about um, feeling that saying you have burnout and looking for help can sometimes feel like a weakness um, if you're struggling to cope and that you're judged for it. Um, so I wonder if you could just maybe make a comment on that. I know you mentioned that and any reflections that you might have on this poll result. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, it really does because it, 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 it you run the risk of bringing into question your your competence, aren't you? If you if you go to your manager and you say I'm not coping uh, at the moment, there's there's that doubt thrown automatically on your competence um, when it shouldn't be. Um, there's it's um, I I don't know what the what the, the easy answer to this is, and I noticed that somebody else had also put in that there's a focus in the questions that there's there's a focus on burnout just now, but it's not a new concept. This thing has been going on for a very very long time. Um, I think it's probably become more visible at the moment and a lot more people have read more readily gone through it simply because of the of the the, the, the change in dynamics of how we work. Um, and it, it, it always reminds me of that. Um, I don't know if you've seen it. There's an animation that, that, that goes around and it's a, um, a, a chap that walks around and he, he, he touches people um, who are sad or feeling low and he takes on their their their, their color and eventually he fills up with, with with other people's misery and you know sometimes i think that's how you know workers in, in in our field especially kind of feel they take on all that trauma from other people whether you work in uh, frontline services or backroom services and you know we, we need somewhere to to, to to unload that you know and it's really difficult especially if you're working from home i, I spent uh, three hours this morning um, looking at drug related deaths that are happening in Fife and you know with other people and really looking at the details of these and then from that straight on to this meeting so there was no debrief there was no opportunity for reflection uh, and I think that's that's kind of like a sort of you know a, a trademark of what we're all going through at the moment and I think that's why burnout is so visible and really needs discussing at the moment. Um, the, the, the poll question that you put up uh, in previous lives, I can relate to all of those in terms of higher case loads. It's, it's, about, it's about managing expectations. We are we have a finite resource as individual people. Um, however, it sometimes feels that the workplace and the management structures demand more and more of us. Um, and because we are caring people, we want to provide that, but sometimes we just can't. And I think it's about sometimes recognizing your limitations and, uh, and and declaring your boundaries really difficult thing to do especially if you want to be, be seen to be somebody who is a valuable member of the workforce yep thank you phil um so we'll just share the result of the last poll and then i have a, um, a question for carolyn and debbie related to that so lisa if you could bring up the poll so this was about the main source of support so um most people the biggest response was a third of people saying supervision with their line manager, which I guess is encouraging. Um, for those people, peer support was another one and self-care as well. So uh, again, a bit of a mix there. Um, but we had a question come in um, that said the peers and non-peer workers require different supports in your experience, or do you think different supports is appropriate? So yeah, that can go to both Carolyn and Debbie. What do you think? I'm trying to... I think... Um... With, within our team, we're, we're just a small team, so there's six of us and we're a mix of um, NHS and different third sectors, but I think we've got great peer support within our team um, and I think I get better support from my colleagues equally than I do in any kind of line management or supervision or anything else. That's just my experience. And I think that's been mine as well. Um, I find because our team's so small and we're a, a new team, we've been going for two years. I think we've really bonded together, particularly through the COVID, and we do really support each other. And I think we've got to know each other really well and can recognise when somebody's getting a bit stressed or sort of getting to burn out. Because I found that certainly supervision with my line manager was one of the main core, um, causes of my, my stresses. Um, and I, I got more support from the team down here. And as far as, I mean, Oki Health, I'm still waiting on support from them. 
So, and that's been since, since November, because I think they're just overwhelmed as well with, with what's going on sort of through no fault of their own. But I would say most of it has been through sort of peer support, saying that two of our colleagues have just come in, but I would say, yeah, we've been supporting each other. Great. That's good. And um, yeah, unfortunately, um, we're kind of out of time there. So we've now just gone past um, quarter to three. So um, today is flown in. So hopefully everyone found that helpful. I would have loved to have kept the conversation going with the panel. So there are a few other questions. Um, but in the interest of burnout, we don't want to keep everybody going um, for too long. Um, so just a few things to remind you of. This has been recorded and will be available on YouTube. Um, you can still post things on Twitter. Um, using the um, hashtag all burnt out if you want to keep the conversation going there and um, we'll also be sending out an evaluation um, to everyone just for some feedback on the session so um, it'd be really great if you could send those back and um, with as much detail so that we can um, learn from this for future events and um, remember to look out for Hannah's um, research paper and the one coming from the Scottish government and we'll try to share links for those um, when we can um, and also we've had a few comments from people um, in the Q&A just about how much a lot of this is resonating with them and a few people sharing personal experiences. So please do reach out um, to SDF. We have our general email or any of us that were presenting today. If you want somebody to chat to or feel you need a bit of extra support um, with any of the issues that we've discussed today. Um, and I just want to thank all of our speakers for their time and their insights and the panel as well. Um, and obviously for everyone for joining. So I will let you go now and hopefully you can enjoy um, a bit of the sunny afternoon if it is where you are and um, have a nice weekend. Hopefully you get some time for some self-care um, and relaxation, I hope. So thank you very much for your time.